I'm Danette. Um, this is Ross. <laughs> uh, we met about five years ago. Uh, we both come from a history of addiction and we actually met in a rehab. And um, Whereas you were the counsellor? Yes. I was the patient? Yes, but I wasn't counsellor. But nothing unethical? In nothing unethical. And, um, and, and so I, I, we kind of, our, our love journey started from there. I mean, we were quite, um, it's quite late on in our life that we met and we didn't anticipate falling in love the way that we did. No, we didn't. But it, it happened, happened and it was amazing. <laughs> And uh, and yeah, two and a half years ago we got married and decided it was time to start a family. You know, right in the beginning when Ross and I got married two years ago and we decided we wanted to, to start a family, we were all quite old, oldish. We were in our late 30s. Well, eggs are becoming prudes. Yeah, as <laughs> Dr. Gobi would say. And, um, and you don't know where to start. There isn't like a, um, a place in, or like a facility or a centre in in South Africa that caters for the LGBTQ plus community in starting this. You know, you can't go, in, in America and the UK, you can go to an actual center and you can say, look, this is what we want to do and, and all that kind of stuff. And and they just kind of start giving you advice on, on go to this fertility clinic, go and see these people, this is how it starts, this is, you know, kind of the, the law around it and, and, and that kind of thing. There really isn't anything like that in South Africa. So for us, our beginning was really difficult a lot of time spent on Google, and as we know, Google is very bad. But um, you, you kind of start looking for testimonials, and there aren't many. A lot of people don't share their, their road because it is such an emotional journey. I mean, I think we've nicknamed our journey Hurry Up and Wait because that's really what the fertility journey is. So, um, you know, it's it was nice to be able to find a place like Vita Lab where you could actually just you felt very welcomed, first of all, very, very welcomed. And second of all, you were able to kind of just speak your mind and be feel feel accepted. We did start at another fertility center first, and it was a very traumatic experience for us. You know, I've been clean for 10 years now, Ross has been clean for five years. So it was kind of like, a, we've got this now, we've got recovery down, so we've, it's time to really just um, invite that 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 family essence into our lives, and and so yeah, so so it started, and uh, long road, long long road, but I mean, Kaysen's just such long an emotional road. road. Yeah, and yeah. that's the, I think that's the beauty of Doctor Gillette is he is such a he's a straight shooter. You know, he doesn't give you false expectations, and when your expectations are slightly unrealistic, he'll put you at ease and say, look, you know, you need to understand that this is not going to be a quick thing and you need to understand that um, it's going to be a long journey, but we keep at it. We keep going. Now, just the support that he always offered was amazing. He was there every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And in terms of us feeling old, it's because the older you get, the more difficult it becomes. So mm -hmm. that's how in our head. I know we're not old, we actually quite young. Yeah, but, <laughs> but in fertility, we're old. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's scary in a sense because we're hoping to have a second child and by the time we're ready to do that we will probably be close to our 40s but we're confident in in what Vita Lab does and we'll probably go back 110%. I mean, we, we become their, their personal PR. We're, we're constantly referring people. No, we're so. very close to a lot of people. Then. Yeah. Very, very close to it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you felt like you were a family. It wasn't even a, two ways about it. Every single person from the time that you walked out of that elevator to reception to say, I'm here, you're having long conversations with the receptionists. Then you're going straight to, to the sonar rooms and you're having long conversations with the sonar ladies. And, and it's just, you know, you, and then you go to the nurses and Sister Veli is just, you know, shame she's just to look at us and like, be this is going to be half an hour. She can just, <laughs> yeah. We actually did artificial insemination. So what was nice is Dr. Gabet explained to us the different options. <coughs> Excuse me. And he said to us, look, start with, uh, with AR first, IUR. Let's see how that goes. Let's do it for about six cycles. And if still by that time, you know, we still don't have any luck, then we move on to IVF because we didn't have a fertility problem. It's not like we were experiencing infertility. It was, we just don't have the biologicals of man to be able to do what we want to do. So we had to go the route of um, 
first finding out if there's an infertility problem, which there wasn't. Uh, there were complications. We um, had to terminate our first uh, cycle simply because Ross's estrogen and progesterone levels were a bit weird. So we had to manage that a bit better and, and did our first insemination. And sure, that was, that's why we called it the hurry up and wait. Because you hurry up to wait for a menstrual cycle, <clears throat> then you start growing the follicle and you, you wait. And then you, it's time for the trigger injection and you take the trigger injection and you wait. And then it's insemination and then it's those two weeks. And those two, two weeks are horrific. I think those are the worst weeks. Waiting for that pregnancy test is just... But I think on the second one, we actually started losing hope. Mm -hmm. And um, I said to Netta, I'm like, we have to keep going because they said at least four. But I mean, you've lost sort of momentum in things and just had to keep going, mm -hmm. which was, I think, very disheartening for us. It was hard to even work. I mean, we do work for ourselves, but even just to wake up, it was starting to become very emotional. Mm -hmm. And we find ourselves here um, after so many trials and counts of everything. But yeah, it happened. It eventually happened. We eventually fell pregnant on the third insemination. And um, yeah, I just that day was. I think I think we even phoned the reception and we were like, tomorrow, we know you can't tell us. We know you can't tell us. But is Sister Belly there? Is someone there? We've got the Ampath result. Just tell us it's a yes. We know it's a yes, but just confirm it for us. And she was like, guys, I can't do that. You know I can't do that. So just she was, do it. Just <laughs> say it, you know. You know. And, uh, and then suddenly, um, Auntie Colleen phoned and she said, guys, this is it. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, we both burst into tears after her. And we'd given up and we've heard infertility journeys, you know, when people get to that, that ceiling push where they say, we just can't do this anymore. Either they can't afford it or you know, it's just too emotional. This is the last cycle and if come what may, it happens. And, and we had reached that point only on the third attempt, or the third insemination for the cycle. And and it happened. And it's, I think it's really because we started calming down. We were like, well, it's gonna happen if it happens. Kind of stop worrying about what you're eating, how you're eating it, what's your lifestyle like, and is this good, is this bad, stop over, it, it's just the overthinking is a little bit. to do with a lot of hope. Like losing mm -hmm. hope, that you sort of just let yourself go. Yeah. And a lot was going on at that time as well, work wise. Work wise, yeah. Well. Which is very stressful. So I think that also played a role. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, then it just kind of just fell into place. And funny enough, for the last cycle, Ross had two follicles available, which is not something that we'd had before. So we had yeah. the chance. Oh my God, twins. Yeah. You know? Oh, uh, we did. We, we we prayed long and hard and asked Dr. Gobet many times, please can we have twins? Please make it happen. Do your crystal ball, prayer rug, whatever it is. And what's that big signboard that says yeah. We cater for the needy, not the greedy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and now in hindsight, having had Caitlin, I think... Um, I the think Lord knew we really needed one. <laughs> we just needed one. one. Yeah. yeah, we weren't going to... Sure, I read to take a hat off to parents with twins or triplets or... Or even just single just, parents. Yeah, it's just... Single mother. I'd have had the experience of having Caitlin in my addiction. It's just, you can't compare it. It's, it would have saved me in an instant, but it, I wasn't ready then, you know? And yeah, it just, it, it solidifies all your past experiences. And it, being a mother is just- But all of that just goes away. It's a whole That's new thing. But she's not gonna get tuck money for the rest of her life. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. A lot of people don't really tell you that, you know, you just get that, that banner of fertility treatments very expensive. But I mean, it is it is expensive. It's not your normal treatment. But there was a there was a cycle where Ross's follicle grew really really quickly, and we couldn't get the specimen from Cape Town to Joburg quick enough. And we phoned Dr. Govetz and we said, look, we don't know what to do. We don't have the cash flow to purchase from the sperm bank downstairs. What he says, just pass it in the you know. And everyone in the everyone in the in the in the rooms in the centre. They were just so happy to, to, to help, assist, yeah. you know, and really just say, guys, Thank you, there's something bigger at heart here. So we understand, sort it out at the end of the month. And that was just for us, it was like, we're sitting at the, with our backs against the wall. It's going to come to an end. The cycle's not going to happen. And, and it did because everyone's in it together. 
Yeah, it's really... you stop, you have to start all over again. Mm. Which, you have to go through the process, is it going to take, isn't it? Mm. You know, if you leave a gap, that's what Mr. Robert said. Mm. If you leave that gap, then you have to try again. Yeah, yeah. just stop, 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 stop. So you did all the injections in the past. Yeah, I did. Mm. Yeah. It's, it was a lot. It was a lot to take that eventually your body's like, okay, this is enough now. When my legs just kept bleeding. You go into the next leg, but you had to alternate, and then it's a stomach. But yeah, your body does take a toll. Mm. Um, but like I said, one of those things, it was worth it. Mm. So, regardless, I think. Yeah. And it was medication every day. But luckily, we had started the folic acid and the vitamin D pregnant mum had it about six, seven months prior to Katen. Being conceived, yeah. So that, that made a whole big difference, I must mm. say. Yeah. I think it was important for us, you know, as you as we started with the journey, to make sure that the oven was well looked after. Because you become desperate. This is not like a normal situation where a heterosexual couple, oh, we'll go at it again next month. Oh, we'll go at it again next month, you know. The, it's, it's right here, it costs a lot of money, it, we're so desperate for it, we're not getting any younger, and you just want it to work. So you try and, you know, drink cranberry juice and you go onto Google and Google says, eat this, and you're like, oh, okay, let's eat that, you know. And we, we really just wanted to make sure that Ross's oven was really well looked after. And the medication, you don't realize the amount of medication that you're gonna be taking or Ross is gonna be taking until we were in it. But Sister Belly was amazing in, in saying, you know, keep going guys, this is how to do it better, don't inject here, try and do this, try and do that. And and it did, it, it did get to the end where you were just showing out inject Ross and she would bleed and bleed and bleed. And, and I think that was also one of the things that I just can't do this anymore. I can't bear to see Ross go through that. She can't bear to go through it anymore. And when we got that positive pregnancy test, it was like all of that was Superfluous, it was just gone. Well, we went through that a bit it's over now. You know, this no, is paramount. I don't yeah. even think about it. Yeah. I think what made it difficult for us in terms of us being a gay couple as opposed to, I can't say normal because we're just as much normal, in a man and a woman relationship is the fact that we had to know every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So everything that we did, we like scoped it and mm -hmm. you know, from A to Z. Whereas a man and a woman, they were just, okay, pop luck and be pregnant. Let's, okay, wait the whole nine months. Ours was every third day, every week, every two weeks, we just had to know the process. And it was nerve wracking because then you're thinking of Down syndrome, then you're thinking of this because those are the things that could happen because of our age. Mm. And I must say that the pregnancy throughout was very, very stressful. Mm. I don't think I had a happy pregnancy. Mm. Um, I think the happiest was when Katen would move, then I'm like, okay, she's fine, you know, it's a tough thing. I think when you've, when everything is so controlled, because this is a very controlled journey, you learn, you learn a lot and you kind of, you're constantly going through each process. So the first process is, let's get the menopause going, let's get the follicle grow. You see the follicle grow, you start to understand where that follicle goes what happens next, okay, now it's time for the trigger injection. Then you understand what's happening in that process, that medical process. And so a lot of the journey that should be exciting and looking forward to, to happiness in terms of being mothers, and it was definitely over, overthrown by the, the medicine behind it and the biological processes behind it and implantation, and then it's the zygote, and then from the zygote, then it's this, and then you kind of like, where are we at in this, how can we, prevent something from going wrong and and then when Ross did fall pregnant it was the same thing you know you you, you fall pregnant you got to wait two weeks again for another um oh sorry it was 48 hours for the next uh, test then you've got to wait you know kind of five weeks to go for your next scan and and in that time google and Dr. Kibet used to say to us don't do that to yourself but you do you sit on google a lot and you this could happen and you could have a silent miscarriage and you can have this and you're so desperate to keep this going. This is your dream. You want to keep it going for as long as you can. It's like we're making ourselves sick. Mm. You know? And um, and then Ross did, you know, our, pedi our pediatrician, our gynecologist, 
did say that Ross had developed gestational diabetes from the hormones, the artificial hormones that we use during fertility, which we'd never heard of. So we were like, okay, we'll take you at face value. We don't know any better. Yeah. And uh, suddenly there was this, this concern about baby growing too big and and she didn't, she was born with a little tiny thing, 2.4 kilos. <laughs> so we and didn't even need to go through that, but we did it anyway. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like I said, hurry up and wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, the advice that we would give other couples is, it's not hard in terms of getting the process started. Find a wonderful fertility clinic, go straight there. Yeah, in other words, go to Vita Lab because they're the best. But, um, Go, go and see a doctor, go through the whole process and what needs to happen and just keep going. Um, at every point there is, there's legal, in, there's le legalities that not many people know about. You know, it was very important for us to be able to both be on the birth certificate because we have gone through this journey together. Our intention is to have a child together. Whether one's carrying on it or the other one's carrying it, it's our child together. And, we couldn't find any legal assistance with this. So luckily enough, the legislation changed in South Africa recently, funny enough, in February last year, where both of us could be on the birth certificate without ha having to go to the High Court to get that sorted out in the High Court. But there, there really isn't any kind of um, go between in terms of the legality. But um, Vita Lab did offer us that. They said to us, there is a lawyer that is available here if you guys needed to chat to them. We just booked an appointment, we sorted out. And that was kind of like, wow, you know, this is a full in, in, uh, a full encompassing, like a very holistic approach to what we're going through. And um, yeah, the more advice I'd give is, when people say it's an emotional journey, it's an emotional journey, there's loss that you go through without even realizing it. You set yourself up as a couple for this is going to be the cycle. The hope is there, the love is there, the, the being together, this is going to be our dream come true. And then it dies at the end. And it's a case of just, just understanding it, it's a process. Perseverance. Keep going, you know, just keep going. We, we've come from a history of, you know, there's a lot of stigma against us. And we know what that feels like. And we know what it feels like when people kind of look at you and not really understand that this is just love, it's just acceptance, it's, we don't need to have a label, we don't need to suddenly become gay activists, we don't need to do anything of the sort. Just treat us like normally and we'll be fine. And the perseverance that we found in that process of stigma, you just use in, in this journey when things get tough. We've also had friends who have fallen pregnant on the first go and you kind of sit and you look at them and you're like, how did you get that right? Flip man, you know? But you just keep growing and keep growing, and, and the trade-off is phenomenal. The trade-off is absolutely phenomenal. And it's a love that you'll never ever experience, you know. And they say that being part of the LGBTQ family is, is about love and it's about acceptance. Have a kid, and then you truly understand what that means. Because you fight it every day. But right, this is, you can't fight it. It's just there. I mean, our child is amazing. It's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. I think one of the things that I, which is not really part of the fertility journey, but after the fertility journey is, and what I think a lot of couples don't realize can happen, is when Katyn was born, I, as the partner, found it very difficult to connect with Katyn in the first three days. Because it's, as much as it's an emotional thing, it's also a reality thing. And the reality is, this is this is my child. I've gone through the process of baking this baby with Ross. But from a maternal aspect, it didn't come, she didn't come from me, if that makes sense. And it was very tough. It was very difficult. I thought I'd never get to experience a connection with my daughter, that I'd never be able to connect with her, that there'll always be this this barrier, this biological barrier. And, and we had long conversations about it. It was very difficult in the hospital for me. But eventually that all falls away and you, you have this moment of connection. And the only thing I do want to say is right at the end of your fertility journey, when you've done this, those times will come as the partner, but it'll go away. Keep going at it. Um, 
because that's why I felt bad when people would say, "Your oh, Katie looks like me," and mm. because it would hurt her, obviously. So it's mm. like, well, as long as she doesn't look like a donor, mm. then you know that's the mm. only way to ease it. I think. Yeah, it, it does get easier. You kind of start to, you know, you. I think as young kids, you grow up with this fairy tale of. You know, you're going to marry your Prince Charming and Prince Charming, you're going to have kids and they're going to look like the both of you. And as life gets, you kind of grow older and you're like, okay, Prince Charming becomes the princess. So I'm going to marry my princess and, um, and, and you want to have kids together. And the reality is they're not going to look like both of you unless you, you take the option of doing, you know, different eggs. Like if I was to use my eggs and then implant them into Ross and we wanted to try and go as natural as possible in the first go. Um, but it, it, it's a social norm that really just bugs you in the end. And that's why we also try to find a donor that looks like both of us. Mm. So it was yeah, like the whole out of character thing. Mm. But so. that whole donor process is hectic as well. That is just something that you don't really anticipate because you're like, okay, let's go through the list. We'll find someone real quick because we just need the biologicals. But when you start reading them, you're like, oh my gosh, you need to take not only, you know, the eyes and the ears and the nose and all that kind of into consideration, it's family health history. Because now you kind of have a bit of an option. What do you want to allow in the genetic pool here? And that became quite intense. Yes, then even though the looks in that were great, move on because the history is bad. Mm. You know, we didn't want to sit with long term or problems in the end yeah and you had to choose four donors at a time which mm -hmm. also made it difficult and then that one only does that procedure like XC or whichever then you have to find another one and there's not many options out there that you want mm -hmm. the child to look like this mm -hmm. I mean the South African um, sperm donor pool is very low for Caucasians and that was something that we wanted to do you know we wanted to be able to build a family that our children looked like us um, and and you can't really find a lot of donors. You, we went from from bank to bank to bank to bank, and eventually found that Cape Town is full of them. Where South, uh, South Joburg is not as as uh, what would you say? What's lenient to that yeah. kind of thing? You know, I think there's there's two or three in 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 Joburg, and their pool is very small. There's anonymous donors, and we we sought legal advice about this. So if you have a live, and Dr. Kibetz also told us, if you have a live donor, you really, you, you, it's not a problem. You know, the andrologists do what they need to do and everything is fine. But he would recommend having a frozen donor because you've got more control over what happens in the moment. So they, they thaw the sperm first and then, and then they can see what's cracking there. Whereas if it's a live donor, you kind of have to go through all the tests before and all that kind of thing. The South African law states that if you have an anonymous donor, they cannot at any point do a paternity test and claim rights over the child. If you have a known donor at any point, doesn't matter what contract you've got in place, they can approach the High Court for the paternity test and they can take paternal rights. Mm -hmm. So by having an anonymous donor through the donor, um, through the, 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 the sperm banks, the donor banks, it means that even if our child had a degenerative, de degenerative um, had a disease of some sort, <laughs> you couldn't, you, you can't even approach the high court to say, listen, can we have a kidney? Can we have bone marrow? It's completely anonymous. The only thing that you do get is you get a little toddler picture to kind of see the, the genetics of the child, of the, the donor. But more than that, that's all you, you get. We were lucky to know that our donor that we chose in Cape Town has 12 straws available and also had been on, the sperm had been on us for 12 years already. Mm -hmm. So the transportation, which is very important. Yes, and this is also something we learned. Is in our first insemination, we got from a place in, in Cape Town. It's not like you can return it if it's really bad, you know. So you're kind of, you're purchasing something that you're hoping will be good. Oh, yeah. And, um, and Dr. Yossi said to us, because he, he did our first insemination, he said, look guys, this is only 800,000 um, sperm counts. It's, it's not very high, normally we want over a million. And we're like, but flip, 
we've just purchased this from this place. What do we do now? Yeah. Marilee phoned us and said, look guys, the best thing to do is when you're purchasing sperm, tell them not to send it on dry ice. So don't dry ship it, wet ship it with liquid nitrogen. Because the thawing of it that way doesn't damage the sperm in any way. So we said, okay, that's fine, we'll do that. The second round we ended up using from a uh, sperm from, from Beta Lab. Um, so we didn't have any issues with that. And then the, the one that was successful, we had it wet shipped. 6.1 million. <laughs> 6 <laughs> 6 1 million. 6.1 million in a straw. So that was kind of like, wow, all right, we, we had two follicles, you know, we've got a fighting chance of this amount of, of uh, sperm going on there. And it, it worked. Sorry. Yeah, seriously. People need to be able to ask questions and there isn't a place to do that. And that was what was so nice about Dr. Gobert specifically because he gave us his number and he said, guys, don't message me and tell me that what you've had for lunch. But if you have a question, I'll answer it. I'll get to answering it. And he always did. And we could always pick up the phone and phone Sister Veli and say, Sister Veli, this is what's happening. This is what we're experiencing. Is this normal? Is this fine? Should we do something else? And always ready to take the call. Always ready to answer the questions. And that puts us puts your mind at ease. Because of, this is such a medical journey and there's a lot of biologicals involved. I mean, what we, we haven't spent seven years in a in a university studying all these things and understanding how all of these processes work and how everything's all interconnected. So to pick up the phone and say, very concerned about this and, and to have someone at the other end saying, guys, it's gonna be okay. That's, that was really awesome.